You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello, hello, hello. How's it going, listeners? Uh, Today is the second episode of the anonymous podcast series that I'm experimenting with. The field we will be exploring today is public equity investing in Canada. Um, You know, it's generally referred to as the buy side or quote unquote hedge funds for simplicity's sake. Uh, We talk about the path to getting a seat as an investor in Canada, uh, the changes in the industry with the growth of robo advisors, how a PM's personal portfolio may actually be different from what they sell to their clients and the reason for why that kind of is the case just with weird industry dynamics and regulations, and much more. We even jump around on just general equity investing too, not just on what you do in that job, but just in investing in general. And you will definitely be able to hear our guest's passion for investing on today's episode for sure. And But to allow for the candidness of the conversation, we've made the guest identity anonymous and you will no- notice, like in the previous episode, that I do change up the person's voice and give them a gender-neutral name. But if you do end up enjoying this different style of interview and want more, and or if you have a different kind of career field that you might be more interested in that I do an episode of, please shoot me a note in the Reach Out tab on my site, oldmandan.com. And if you are a fan of the podcast or you just listen to one and you want to be a fan, please help out uh, by leaving a positive review on iTunes so more people can find it. And also, if you want to continuously learn and develop yourself further, you can definitely sign up for my weekly newsletter called This Week I Learned, where I just fill you in on seven daily things I learned on being healthy, wealthy, and wise from the week. And the newsletter uh, subscription is just all over my website, oldmandan.com, so check it out. And so without further ado, here is this week's anonymous podcast episode on hedge funds, public equity investing, and the buy side. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today is another anonymous, anonymous, anonymous podcast series, and today's guest is an individual who is in the public equities investing space, and so like always, the guests will remain anonymous, um, and I will refer to the individual as Min. Hey, Min. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for uh, joining us on the podcast. And so for the first question, uh, I would like you to explain to our listeners, what is the average day like for an individual who is a public equities investor in Canada? Yeah, so um, probably different for, for everybody, but for me... Um, get up i used to get up sort of around 6 30 ish uh, i've peeled it back even earlier these days so 5 30 quarter to six i'm up and i've got my phones beside me in bed and unfortunately it's more than one phone now and i'm uh i'm checking emails trying to scan through quite frankly like as a public equities investor you get a lot of emails um brokers salespeople, traders uh, automated emails from sort of economic sort of resources um just tons of stuff about what happened overnight what's what's on the docket for that day with earnings releases um it could be anything even technical analysis fundamental analysis from hundreds of different people so i might wake up on average to an average of 100 emails and sort through quickly what's the most important there might be 10 read those quickly um then help the shower head to work um so that whole process might take a, a half hour to an hour and then once I'm at work, it's, it's again, it's a bit of this triage. Um, and I feel, I feel like that's definitely a very unique part of the industry is every day is different, which is, you know, other industries have that, but it's almost like working in, in the ER, right? There's a bit of a triage of what's the most important thing to do right now to maximize my efficiency. Uh, because there's just this deluge of information and just like a sea of information and the whole goal is obviously to be able to pick out the little pearls of how I'm going to be able to add value what am I going to be able to do that day so that's high level what I'm doing to start the day but then once the bell rings uh, I'd like to schedule a lot of calls so everyone's different I used to when I first started 
I was much more uh, reluctant, reluctant to talk to people. So I would, I'd read a lot, I'd print off 10Ks, um, I'd love digging apart a 10k um some people don't it's really boring um and that's fair but once you know how to read a 10k it's kind of just like reading a short novel in my opinion uh like read the story of a company really quickly and skip all that risk information all that stuff at the front like the crap skip all that get to the good stuff and then read the notes if you have time at the end so i used to do a lot of that i'm now you know for better or for worse you sort of build a base of information you don't need to read a 10k on a company that you I've already read one on or that you know the gist about. So now it's a lot of phone calls, phone calls to um, sell side analysts, to um, sell side salespeople, to get a sense of information flow. Um, we're sourcing liquidity. So I currently um, work at a fairly large firm. So liquidity is a big, big important thing, especially in a tight market like Canada. So even if we like something, we have to be able to source the liquidity first and foremost. And if we can't, then it's not even worth working on the idea. So a lot of the day is trying to figure out, number one, if the idea we like, talking to the analysts, getting their opinions, figuring out what their sentiment is, how they're positioned, and sort of their ratings and their estimates, figuring out if we think we have an edge or an advantage against those estimates, and then if we like it, it's sourcing liquidity. So it's a lot of phone calls. Um, a quick lunch, usually at my desk, if not going out to a, uh, a group lunch or a lunch with uh, a management team. And then that's the other thing. It's not every day, but some days still have a lot of management teams and analysts coming into our office and meeting with us. And I really look forward to those. Those are That's kind of like the highlight because the calls are always going to be there. You can always call someone, but getting to meet someone face to face and sort of grill them on their company or grill them on their coverage list is, is something I, I like to do a lot. So. It's a mixture of calls and meetings, but uh, throughout all of that, you always have one eye on the market and one eye on all your monitors and one eye on you know the watch list, the funds, how things are doing, how you're doing that day, how you're doing that week, month, year, date, you know, in the long term. So it's a big balancing act. And then also, as I said, this triage of like, what's the most important thing to be doing at any given second. Gotcha. And would you say then that kind of rhythm is relatively though consistent throughout most of your time throughout the year ah uh, it changes a lot so you have earnings season so i mean unfortunately it happens four times a year and it lasts about two months each time so you really have eight months of the year where you're kind of in battle mode you're walking in what are my bigger names that are reporting today and making sure it goes well and if it doesn't if, you know if, generally speaking if it goes well the outcome reports what you expected or better stock is up or flattish or positive that's a, on the triage list, that, that sinks further down, right? Because I'm not, it's not hurting me. If you have something, if you, worst case scenario is obviously you, you walk in and you have a torpedo. You have something down 10, 15%, it's going to be the worst or second worst or in the top five worst things out there in your mandate, you know, uh, which for me is, is, is sort of North American equities. I, I've done global as well, but North American equities is my focus. So if you know the S&P 500, the TSX 60, sort of like these, these indexes of less than a thousand companies, you know, you don't want to walk in the morning and have the worst one that day, right? Like that's just the worst and it happens to everyone. So that on the triage list goes right to the top and I might spend the entire day on, on that one thing. But if I don't have something like that, I might spend, you know, the entire day on three or four different ideas. And throughout my career, that's changed. Like I've, I've worked with and for people that prefer dig into a company private equity style, do a month or even two months of deep due diligence just on one company, write a massive report, build a huge model, talk to everyone who's ever looked at the company and then be better, you know, be in the top 1% of people that have ever thought or looked at the company. That's one approach I used to do. And now current approach and other approaches I've tried are, um, you know, to spread your bets or go broad instead of deep approach. Cause you really, that's the two matrix, like the two sided matrix. You can either go deep on a company or you can go broad across a lot of companies. So these days I've been going a little more broad and in earlier in my career, I went more deep, um, which I actually think is the inverse of most people, but it, it's just worked out for me that way. So, so yeah, I'm spending, you know, a lot of time throughout the day on multiple different ideas, not just one company. Do you also feel that that different kind of inverse is a result of um, a different strategy in terms of this time frame as well as the size? So, for example, um, I, I, I think I have the view that 
a lot of large cap or larger company oriented strategies for investing purposes tend to not go as deep like, despite having so much information just mm-hmm. because I feel everyone else has that information so mm-hmm. it's, what is the additional value of going so That's deep true. whereas really if you go look at a small company there actually could be the inefficiency because not as many people might be looking at it and there's a lot of risks that are also involved with it. That's fair and I'd say it's also liquidity like the bigger you get it's that curse, right? You have a lot of success, you get big, you start to go from managing hundreds of millions to billions and, and billions in a smaller market is tough to whip around, right? So you're limited, especially in smaller markets to uh, sometimes a handful, you know, dozens of companies. And so just because you're not going deep on one company at any given time, if your career is more than a few years long, you've probably looked at them all at least once and you've probably gone deep on them at least once, especially like I mentioned, some of these indexes that only have 50, 100 or so names. Yeah, like the TSX 60. Like yeah, that. there's only 60 there. And of the 60, only really half are that investable, right? Like if you look at half are gold and energy and just, you know, like really sick, cool companies that require specialist knowledge, and which is not my background. So if you're a generalist, you know, doing equities in North America, yeah, there might only be a couple dozen names you need to know, which sounds easy, but the hard part is, yeah, I'm competing against a few hundred, if not a few thousand people that also all know these companies as well as I do. So going deep, like, I don't know how much value that adds as opposed to going broad and knowing the market and knowing what people are positioned and knowing sentiment, that always adds value because there's a contrarian element to it as opposed to when you go deep on a company and try to find that one little nugget of information. I mean, that's good, but it's extremely rare. Whereas a skill set that's very common Sorry, that a, a skill set that can apply in any market is how is everyone positioned? What side of the boat is everyone on, so to speak? And get me to the other side of the boat, being contrarian. And that doesn't require deep knowledge of companies. It requires a broad knowledge of companies in a market. So it's a little more the trader kind of mindset as opposed to the investor mindset. But I think both are tied at the hip, right? You can't, you can't do the broad thing if you don't know the companies at all. That's just, that's day trading. And you can't just go deep on one company every year and think you know it and know like the know the gems and pearls of information that no one else knows but then oh it's in a sector that's out of favor oh it's it's in a, thematically it's in an industry that's in decline it's like so you just missed the bigger picture or oh you picked something great but it's super crowded it had a ton of momentum behind it and now that that factor is switched and you're you're curtailed by that so i think it's again that broad deep you have to balance both yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that uh, sentiment as well. And I guess just for context for our listeners, um, I find that the three-year mark is the time when, you know, most people either leave a job before three years and they switch to something completely different, or if you've stayed in one career field for long pa- past three years, you're going to stay there for a much longer time. That's kind of like the breakoff point for what I find like statistics for most people. So for you, uh, plus or minus in three years. Uh, plus. Yeah. Plus, yeah. In, in, in terms of, yeah, industry experience plus and at, uh, at employers before plus. Yeah, got it. And yeah, like you, we talked about how you, you mentioned how you were a generalist, um, you know, not very like focused as a specialist. I was a generalist too when I was in the buy side. And, but I, I find that most people, I think on the outside, just assume that, oh, you, so what sector do you cover? Yeah. Like, when I went and told people that, oh yeah, I'm, I'm at a fund out in Calgary, they were they all just oh so are you a oil and gas oil, engineer yeah, or sure. are you in mining? And also no, I actually don't look at any of that. Well, that, I mean that's the way the industry's going. Unfortunately, is um, some people may disagree with this, but uh, you know I try to meet as many people as possible in this industry, and it's it's a really small industry, and the and the seats are shrinking every year, right? As you know, so um, every person I meet with though that's senior at large institutions and sort of banks, insurance companies, pension funds, they want people to specialize. And there's probably a bunch of different reasons for it. I'm not really sure 100% what's the driving force behind it, but I think there is this sense that as information has gotten more and more readily available and cheaper and people are getting faster, the skill set of a generalist, like at first glance, seems to be fading or that ability to drive alpha is fading because Oh, what you do is just surface level and you're dancing across all these different pies and not going deep on companies or deep on you know sectors. How can you really drive off of versus people that are going deep on those sectors? And I'll just pay 
five people to do five sectors super well and pay you a fifth of that total pie, but to have to do all that work and try to beat those other five people. So I think there's like this simplistic kind of argument that, oh, five people doing one thing super well beats one person doing five things so-so. And so common sense suggests that that's true, but investing is weird where I don't actually believe that is true because it's for what we talked about, right, is you don't build a portfolio of best ideas. And I think there was a study done 10, 20 years ago. I'll try to find a few, but I can't remember who referenced it, but they basically took an investment firm and they asked every sector specialist to pick their best idea every year. And they made a fund just out of those and it had awful performance. I can't remember if it was Fidelity or what it was, but someone did that and had terrible performance. And they reported on it and they were trying to figure and diagnose why that was. And I can't remember the conclusion, but I remember that sticking out with me that like, you know, just because you have a best idea in a sector, you know, maybe that sector is a zero. Like the, right now you don't have any eggs in that basket, so to speak. And maybe there's one sector in the entire market that's just working and, and, and it's attracting capital and it's attracting flows. And if you thought about the FANG thing the past three or five years, uh, there was a stat that 90% of the S&P return, it was more than 90% of the S&P return last year for a, a given point, it was year to date, was driven by like five companies, right? Yeah, they're, it, yeah. yeah they're massive, right? Yeah. And so you didn't have to walk in and pick your favorite gold stock and your favorite energy stock and your favorite material stock and your favorite utility stock and your favorite staple stock. All of those underperformed, right? All those people, all those specialists, didn't matter. All you needed was one smart person to recognize something that was happening in the world and say, this is something that's that's a reality. I'm betting on it and I'm, I'm beating out 90% of people because this is the reality right now. So that's where I think the specialist thing gets you into trouble. And so, you know, I'm obviously biased. I'm a journalist, you're a journalist. But uh, I would say that if you're a journalist who's, who's honest about their weaknesses, like, oh, I'm not good in these sectors. These are specialist sectors. Or, you know, I go broad on companies, but not necessarily as deep as I would like to. And you admit where you're weak and play to your strengths, that you're good. But if you try to pretend you're some, you know, savant, like uh, Stan Druckenmiller, and, oh, I can, I can go long junior, I can go long junior E&P oil companies one week and then, you know, junior gold miners the next week and then buy Coca-Cola the next week. And, like, I don't think anyone can play that game super well. But if you're, like, you know where you're strong, you know you get the Buffett circle of confidence and you stick your circle of confidence and then when something's outside your circle of confidence, and it's doing really well, you're very careful, right? Like, I, I'm always extremely careful when someone asks me to look at a company I've never looked at before or an industry I've never looked at before. I'll take way more time. I won't just jump in with the same attitude I use as something I've been following for years. So Yeah, I, I, and I think that's just, it's just back to common sense. It's just being humble with something you don't know, right? Mm-hmm. I don't know if I'm just going to look at it. but And I think like the, the this dichotomy of generalist versus sector it kind of also plays into whether uh, I don't. It might have been Charlie Munger who said it. Or he referred to it like where if you want to be an employee, specialize. But if you want mm. to be an owner, generalize. Yeah. And yeah, that's good. Um, I think as an investor, like Charlie Munger refers to it a lot in terms of creating this mental model. Like you have to learn many different mental models, and if you can actually sync them all up, you have this law of loser effect. And I think for an investor, you have to be able to constantly be learning about so many different things to see how it can all play out because something you learn the still steel industry could very well happen mm-hmm. in like the tech industry like yep. best business best practices practices are transferable in so many different ways and no, totally people learn from different tycoons and all that and so i think I mean, if, if you look at history like that's what history teaches us right and i think the specialization could like you refer to with that study that showed that it just doesn't perform well. it, it kind of leads to people just really focusing too deep on yeah. like, you know, you, you said how you spent a few years in this career, you're going to have looked at practically every company like the TSX 60. Mm-hmm. So then if you specialized only in like oil and gas, you're going to be looking at only like 10, 20 companies for your entire career. Yeah, and then, boring too. yeah, and yeah. <laughs> and eventually I feel like you'll actually get really overconfident and yeah. go, you, you know what, this, this little change, this little change in price or this totally. little change in supply, People do it it's going to make a time. huge effect. It's but it the doesn't... force for the weeds thing. And it exactly. drives me nuts. Like I had a, uh, a younger friend uh, who I'm actually meeting with later today. Um, they were, they're trying to crack into the industry, trying to crack into the business. And, and we're asking me like how I did it, asking for advice. And, and they wanted to prep a stock pitch, which I thought was a great idea. And 
know, to any listeners too, if you're trying to break into the industry, there's nothing better that a PM or someone likes better than free advice. Give me a free idea and then maybe I'll hire you, you know? So, that, oh, yeah. so I told them that I, that's the way to go. And, uh, and so, but what they immediately came back with was this hyper focus on valuation. And I need to find, I need to have the best TCF model and the best Excel spreadsheet and, and you know, just a, a 20 page report and, and really be able to dazzle them with like the amount of depth it's all about that depth, right? Like the amount of like quantity of crap that I've stuffed into this report. And it's all model. this data that yeah, I've all this at. data, and it's just garbage, right? And I and so I sort of politely told them, I'm like, look, there's nothing better than a stock idea you could tell me about sufficiently in two minutes or in an elevator ride, right? The, the elevator pitch and that that whole skill set of the elevator pitch, I think, is fading a bit um, because it it's a skill set that really favors uh, salespeople. And so the institutional equity sales desks are all shrinking rapidly. And some people will even expect that in the next five to 10 years, you won't really have equity salespeople. You'll just contact, you know, analysts and traders directly because why do I need this intermediary? But that skill set is really important. Like the ability to tell a story to another human in a really reduced amount of time, but still have that clear conviction around what the idea was, is a really rare skill set. So I, I told them, look, spend nine percent of your time finding the idea, doing the qualitative work, thinking about, how is this going to make me money? Because that's what it comes down to. Right? We're all optimizing around one variable. How am I going to outperform, you know, either absolute or risk adjusted, but generally speaking, how am I going to outperform my peers or the benchmark? It's, that, it's what's your edge? If you don't have an edge? edge, if you don't have exactly. an edge, then what are you doing? So, you know, the best DCF, whatever in the world. And, and the more I've done this, the more I've realized and more jaded I've become about valuation and the emphasis people play on it. And, I think it's a bit of this this private equity kind of like people look at private equity and they're the stars, right? Like versus public equities for sure. Like the pay is better. They they get to be on boards of companies. They get to own the entire company in some cases, right? They get to use a lot of leverage. It's very sexy. There's public equities is you watch TV and there's these you know e- robo advisory ads and ETF ads and you know you don't add any value. Ninety percent of you underperform the market. And you're just this barrage of information on how awful our industry is, right? As opposed to private equity, it's all sexy and you know right now it's grabbing a lot of money. And so that's part of this cycle, this low interest rate cycle, which I think will change at some point. But I think people are subconsciously and consciously very. Uh, jealous of private equity and how they do things and in private equity most of those employees come from the banking world where it is that go deep do the extra crazy powerpoint and do the extra crazy excel spreadsheet with 50 tabs and and you know stay at the office till two in the morning and that's that's what a successful investor looks like and then they you know you get into public equities and some people work nine to four and they take a two-hour lunch and maybe they read all day on a lazy boy and that's work so i think people just view it as like I want to do what private equity people do or do what bankers do. And so you have young people coming up that want to crack into the public equities industry with that mentality. And I sort of, whenever I meet anyone like that, I push back and say, our industry is very different. You can be an absolute genius, add a ton of value, make a ton of money and work like 20, 30 minutes a day, like true work, like thinking work. And that's all it takes. It just takes one idea. Buffett and Munger, I was, wa- I was watching before and came here, the 1996 Berkshire Hathaway AGM, someone posted the uh, like a clip from there. And I like to go back and anything obviously Buffett's read or said or done, I like to read. Um, and this was one where he was saying, you only need three great businesses to have an extraordinary amount of success to build a massive fortune. He kept saying three. And then there's another speech he gave at the University of Florida, I think in the 80s, where he said you need no more than six. So he's always kind of gravitated to saying like, look, if you really want to create a ton of wealth for yourself and you know businesses and you're a business analyst, it's somewhere in the, the low to mid single digit number of companies you ever need to A, work on and B, own. I think Charlie Munger only owns four. Yeah, he only owns four. And, and if you check his filings, <laughs> he's owned the same four for like a decade now. <laughs> he bought them in the, I think he bought, uh, it might be City, Bank of America. It's not Fiat Chrysler. No, yeah, he doesn't. Have no, um, is, is it four banks? Like Wells, Wells Fargo. Fargo. Wells Fargo, Wells Fargo is, I think, is a big one. He had Posco. I think. Posco, the steel. Yeah, 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 I mean, yeah that's yeah. been a nightmare. But I mean, he had an interesting thesis on that. If you go back and listen to it, but yeah, he just he bought banks at the depths of the financial crisis, and he still owns them, and that's fine. And you know, he's probably done pretty well. He's probably marginally outperformed the S and P five hundred with that. 
but he hasn't suffered any losses. There's been no transaction. You know, there's been no slippage. There's been no fees. There's been no commissions. There's been no like selling on drawdowns and they're not being able to keep up with the market. Like he's earning a return is slightly higher than the SPC. He's outperformed purely because he's a big business analyst and purely because he's buying, you know, a couple companies. He's not trying to buy 50 and trade in out of them. So yeah, I, I definitely like, at least in my personal investing, uh, I stay very concentrated and, and try not to trade that much and, and definitely inf- I force myself to only own a handful of names and, and, try to own them for three plus years uh and in some cases almost five years so um yeah i would encourage and back to that that person trying to break into the industry that's what i told him was like just find me one of those or find me something you think is one of those because 99 percent chance it's not going to be one of those kind of wonderful businesses or one of those great ideas but try don't don't do the doing an excellent dcf an excellent pitch an excellent whatever and then tell me there's 50 percent upside because that's what everyone else does and it's just I don't have time for that. Right? What do you? What, why am, why am I investing fifteen percent yeah. offsite for? Especially man. if you think about the payoff for an employee. Like I just paid you X to work on it for a month, and all these resources, and pay for your thirty thousand dollars Bloomberg license, and all that, just so you can go find me some ten percent upside, which is less than the standard volatility of the index. Right? The index is going to fluctuate fifteen plus percent in any given year. If your upside is only that, you're basically telling me you found luck. Dude, I can I can day I can day trade Shopify and I can make like ten percent a day. Yeah, bet on bet on like just flip a coin on Shopify's next earnings. It'll probably be up more than ten percent, right? So yeah, when people pitch that, and that's what they teach in school. Like you go to any university, that's what they're teaching. They're teaching this hyper deep penetrative work on average indexy kind of names, efficient market hypothesis, all that, diversify out to fifty plus names. And then, yeah, when you something's up 20%, sell it. When something's down 20%, buy it. And then just keep doing that. And you know what? A lot of PMs, you know, in, in our industry do that. They graduate from these business undergrads and they go and put that to work. And those are the people that underperform because it's, it's garbage, right? If you're sitting there thinking, oh, the pathway to wealth is I'm going to buy something at a 10% discount and sell it at a 10% premium and I'm going to get these opportunities all day long and they're easy to spot and no one else sees them and I'm a genius. I'm going to do it across 50 companies. That's a loser's game. It's a massive, a winner's game is, it can be a combination of things, right? You use multiple ways to win this game, which is why it's so fascinating, but a clear one that's worked for basically. And what's interesting about the owning a couple names and why that works is because if you think about the business entrepreneur parallel, any person who didn't inherit their wealth, there's basically three. If you look at the Fortune 500, there's three buckets of people. There's people that inherit their wealth. Um, there's uh, there's financial, basically people that manage other people's money. You know, that's why the industry is so good. <laughs> and then there's entrepreneurs. Right? There's people who start businesses. And so really the two-thirds of it is, is you're inheriting an entrepreneur's money or you're an entrepreneur. And an entrepreneur is simply an investor who has 100% of their eggs in one basket. So that's what always interests me about concentrated investing or wonderful businesses is that the, the the delineation, the distinction between an entrepreneur who ends up becoming a billionaire and an investor who ends up becoming a billionaire. If you're doing similar practices, finding great businesses, owning them for long periods of time, not trading, uh, really focusing on what identifies a moat or competitive advantage of a great business, those kind of skill sets, that's the same thing that created Sam Walton, right? That created Warren Buffett. There's not that much difference between them, in my opinion. It's it's having the conviction to hold something for decades and having that compound at a higher rate of capital because it's a wonderful business, right? So, sorry, that was a long rant. But when someone comes out of school and, and they want to break into this industry and they they say you like I want to work on uh, I want to work on Apple, I think there's ten percent upside because people are being too pessimistic. I just I, I do my best to try to encourage them to go back to the more natural, naive way of looking at things, which is go find me a great idea. Go find me something I can go double or triple my money in and tell me why you think that can happen and why other people don't think it can happen. And there's not a lot of people out there doing that anymore. Yeah, there's a, there's a lot of problems. I, <laughs> there's a, there, there are a lot of problems in the industry, and I think that's why we're getting, uh, we're getting a lot of um, shit for it. And... Like you, this idea, like, it's just out there. Everyone knows it. Every, there's been plenty of great investors who've said 
concentrated. There have been plenty of great investors mm-hmm. who said it's it's not about looking busy. And yeah, like I, man, like when when I was working, I'd spend like sometimes the great days when you just spend five hours just staring off into space, just thinking, Burp. and people just think like it. And there's this mentality like I I got it from. Like I was in accounting and consulting, and that's a very rah rah type A toxic mm-hmm. culture. If I gotta show off how how hard I work to show mm-hmm. my value, because I'm so insecure about myself, and so it's like, hey man, I worked a hundred hours. Dude, guess what? I worked 120 hours, and yeah. it's just, it's just stupid. Yeah, it's just, I mean, and it's all part of this thing we're kind of talking about is like alpha versus beta. I think historically the industry was different. There was the Peter Lynches and whatever, and they. And, they created value, whatever, but they're riding these roaring bull markets. They're yeah. taking a lot of beta. Like, like Peter Lynch, yeah, he's he, he was a good investor. Good but, investor, trailblazer. I'm not taking anything away from that, but, but it took a lot of beta, right? And so these days where you have way more information, the internet really started to take off in the 90s and is obviously invading everything we do and, and eat and sleep and drink is, is impacted by the internet these days, right? So in that kind of information quality world, um, the game is changing, and which I think makes sense. And the game is going towards much, much more of the pie is going to beta and Vanguard and BlackRock and Lofi. And I think that makes 100% sense because the average person is going to do very well with average returns. But there's no question. Like I even tell close family, friends, whatever, um, that'll ask for advice. I'll say, like, I can tell you what I do, but I will encourage you to just ETF it, just index that out and just... Don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't mess with it. Just every little dollar you get in the, that is in savings, put it into an account, ideally tax free, and then put it into something index related with low fees. And that's going to work really, really well over five plus 10 plus 15 plus years for everyone. But if you're someone that's a junkie like I am and they need to do this, don't go and have this massive portfolio of ideas. Don't go work 120 hours trying to like build wealth through trading and and i'm a hypocrite because right? i go into work and that's what we do right and we're doing it in a very fast way and we're, we're trying to do it the more traditional way with some nuances which i enjoy but um and it brings results but personally i don't have the resources i don't have the time and i don't want to do it that way right for myself and for other people i think the best thing is just identify even one business like one business where you can picture yourself like on the board, or you can picture yourself 10 years out or 50 years out as this multi, multi, multi-millionaire. And it was purely because you put a little bit of money into X and you're in love with X. It's like Coca-Cola and Geico to Buffett, right? I'm sure if he could get rid of everything else he owned and he could only own Geico, he'd probably be okay. He totally. could, and if he only owned Apple, oh, sorry, yeah, Coca-Cola, he'd probably be okay, right? So you identify that one thing Maybe two or three if you're lucky, but one thing where you can sleep at night, you feel just super fortunate, if anything, lucky to own this business. And there's a handful of them out there where it's going to be, and it's also very personal too, because some people will look at what that business is for me and say, oh, I could never sleep at night with that kind of business, or, oh, I don't like that industry, or I don't like that management team, or they just don't fit my personality. And then for me, I just love it, right? I just, you want to know the CEO's middle name, right? You want to know... The CEO's spouse's name, um, everything about the company fascinates you. You'd want to work there. You want to get paid 100% in stock if you could. Like that kind of passion for a company. Once you have one of those, don't put a 2% weight in the thing. Like put a lot of your money into it because that thing is extremely rare and you're diluting that passion for it and that brilliance that it's going to compound at by having all these other ideas. So, anyways, I'm, I'm ranting again, but I'm, I'm extremely passionate about concentrated investing because it's a dying art it's 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 supposedly alive and well in the hedge fund crowd but then they go on the other side and they do long short and they do risk parity and they do you know like tons of other like uh, portable alpha and all these other strategies where you're like you're going back to the same hundreds of positions thing and just just have some conviction in a business yeah i think the it's it's been a really when when i'm seeing this industry shift and most I also have a hard time. I used to have a hard time explaining to my friends what I did mm-hmm. because when you tell someone I'm a public equities investor, it's sometimes it's so much easier to say, I just look at a hedge fund and yeah. they just go, okay, cool. Got yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. But I think, I think the more correct term is like 
you're all asset managers and there's hedge funds, mutual funds, mm-hmm. ETF providers. And I think I've been trying to, I guess, explain it as hedge funds are kind of more sometimes smaller. And then I'd say usually the mutual funds are much bigger. And mm-hmm. then ETF providers are kind of big and small, but yeah, no, they're, no. they're practically, they, most of them don't provide that much mm-hmm. alpha. It's just tracing indexes. That's it's just helping other people mm-hmm. get access to that. Um, is that how you would? Yeah, I, I'd or? agree. I mean, I would also divide it up. So I've worked for boutique firms, mm. um, large independent managers, um, and then you know I won't name them, but like big institutional money, right? Like sort of the the ones we were sort of alluding to. And those are three very different things, but they're all long only public equities investors. And so the norm that I've noticed, because I've worked at a few of them of the sort of the boutique money managers is a little closer to the ideal we were talking about. A lot tend to have 20, 25, sometimes 30 to 50 companies on the high end, um, but generally no more than 20 companies. Um, and so that's a decent amount of concentration, like maybe 5% per name and sort of your bigger names. Um, and that's okay. I think that's a good start. But the pitfalls they have there is when you're that small, you generally you're, you have to gear yourself towards the high net worth crowd because you can't go hire 100 people to start a retail organization right you need to you need to do a lot with a little so you have to hire a couple people to go scout out people worth tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars manage their money and it i just think there's a mismatch between those people that have done so well it was kind of the the buffer quote about you know, people that, that drive in, in uh, limos and Rolls Royces taking advice from people that take the subway, right? Like, if, they're, if they've been that successful, why do they really need you to go out in the market and eat them out a little more return? Like, I think high net worth, ultra high net worth crowd, the best thing for them is actually wealth planning, estate planning, tax management, all the strategies that keep what they have. Because quite frankly, if you're in the top 0.1% of the 1%, You've, you've won the game. So the goal should be to keep what you, you have. When you win a basketball game, you win any sport, you don't try to win it by a little more, right? You try to keep the lead, you know? So I think there's a mismatch there. But going back to your question, yeah, the, the boutiques have an interesting area, interesting strategy around picking stocks or, or money management, which is a little more concentrated, but I just still feel like there's a mismatch with the customer base. The mutual funds, they have the most alignment with their customer base because you're generally selling mutual funds to the middle class, right? You're not selling mutual funds to ultra high net worth individuals. Some cases, high net worth people have mutual funds, but mutual funds were seen as a an easy way to provide upside and retirement savings for the lower middle class and a really effective way of doing that all through the 80s and 90s. Now the ETF world is, is completely, you know, wiping that world out. The key difference being, do you want to seek those higher above average returns with above average fees, or are you okay with average for below average fees? And I think that's probably where the most opportunity is, because I do think that the people that need or that ideally want that alpha and that upside, and, and instead of being okay with a 5% return, probably need a 10% return in order to go from maybe being lower class to being middle class, or go from being middle class to being middle upper class, like to really improve quality of life through money management, that target market is well served by someone trying to take risk, someone trying to do better. Because if the S&P 500 delivers 5% over the next 20 years, they're 50 years old and they're ill-prepared for retirement, that's not gonna be enough. So we need to design strategies to get you more with less risk. And that's where an investor can add a lot of value, change someone's life. But there really isn't firms or big institutions focused on that because they get so big, they lose sight of that goal and the whole thing becomes asset gathering and not money management. So again, so that's the second part of it. And then uh, what would you say is the third part? So there's mutual funds. And then like ETF boutiques. providers. And yeah, and then yeah. the ETFs. And I think the ETFs are well aligned. Like they're, they're providing data that low fee, that world is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper. There's an argument out there, which I believe strongly, but I haven't heard talked about enough, that eventually um, you will get paid to own an ETF. Similar to how, um, what is it? So like uh, insurance companies, right? In the insurance world, they compete the profit pool down to a negative carry just so that they get the float so that they can invest. So and the insurance goes in these cycles where 
there's the soft insurance market and a hard market, but basically meaning pricing comes down and down and down on life insurance and property insurance just because they can go take your money and then invest it. In the investment world, in theory, it's the same thing. You pay me a fee and I invest your money, but that fee is coming down, down, down. If it ever got to zero, could it go negative? Like, could you pay negative to get your money managed? And I actually don't see, in theory, you could, because then they can do other things with your money. Once they have you as a customer, why don't I cross sell you a banking solution? Or why don't I provide you a mortgage? Or why don't I, like, I just want you in my arms as a customer so that I can cross sell you a lot of other stuff. So we, we've had negative interest rates in the country. Yeah, so we've exactly. Actually had, why yeah, wouldn't you yeah. have negative fees on investment products? Because if you're not adding value to me, you know, pay me for my the privilege of my money, right? Because my money comes with a lot of great things. It buys you cloud. It buys you scale. It buys you the ability to lock me in for years as a customer and cross sell me other things that you do make money on. So, yeah, I, I really I think the beta part of the market. While I wouldn't want to be, you know, maybe the owner of Vanguard, or I'm skeptical about a BlackRock's profitability, even though I've liked them in the past. I think they're doing a great public service, but eventually you're going to need those alpha seekers, like the people that are trying to add value. They are a nice counterbalance in the market, and and that crowd is getting just beaten to crap, right? And so they need to, at some point, our industry will need to like redefine how it, how it sees itself in the alpha-beta war, so to speak. And so... If you're one of people in the alpha camp like I am, you have to have a very clear strategy on how you deliver alpha and how you deliver it cost effectively to customers. But even then, I think, like just like you, how how you mentioned how the way you manage your own money is different from how you do it at your job. And I think for me, one I, would, I won't name the individual of the fund, but the person I respect who is a portfolio manager, a very established portfolio manager with a great fund, the person also told me that yeah, if I could run my own money i'd only have 10 stocks yeah. and I'll, I'll tell you that these 10 stocks and yeah but the person manages a 60 company like 70 company fund i mean I'm, I'm almost identical to that right i've worked in organizations um where it's sort of you're, you're managing between 40 and 100 companies and and my pa my personal account has never ever had more than 10. i think max i've ever had was eight companies and the minimum i've ever had was like three or four and I'm currently at five. And I like having five. I'm very comfortable with five. And actually, my biggest position is like 30 40%, actually closer to 40% of my liquid net worth, which seems crazy, right? Like all the things you read about efficient market, but like that's way too much risk. I sleep like a baby. And I've been, I've been outperforming how I do at work. I've been outperforming the market. Not because I'm just some genius, but because back to what we talked about, identify a company you love, you're passionate about, that you have... 80, 90, 100% conviction and and just hold it. And it's just not, it's not that hard. But anyways, we got off track again. But, uh, <laughs> but yeah, that, I think you're right. There are There's a disconnect between how people manage money for themselves and how they manage money for customers. And that's a byproduct of how bloated our industry is, how big it got through the 80, 90s bull market. And then today, you've got people stuck in this industry getting paid above average. Anyone in our industry gets paid above average. And it doesn't matter what they say. Like pay has come down. There aren't these mutual fund managers out there getting paid ten million dollars anymore. It just doesn't happen. Like the wealthiest, highest paid money managers in our industry probably make a couple million dollars a year, right? It's just that's where you peak out now. Um uh, and every that has shrunk the pie for everyone below them. But still, if you're out of school, you know, and you're whatever, nineteen, twenty years old and you go work at a big fund company, you're an analyst, and you know that's great. And those number of seats have shrunk. But if you're one of those people, you still make six figures right out of the gate, right? For most. So that's way above average, you know. And uh, and yeah, that comes at the expense of the customer directly. So plus all the trading fees, all the commissions, all the bloat, right? So so yeah, that's that is really what's under siege. Is not it's not the inability to outperform. It's the size of the pie. And the cost, and, and that will change. It's already happened, but uh, yeah, it's just once that changes, we can hopefully in this ideal world may never happen. Get back to the how people manage money for themselves is how they manage money for customers. And, and so, but for someone that's um, in the industry who is seeing and experiencing that kind of misalignment, where how you would run money is completely contrary to how these companies do it, and sometimes it's not 
the PM's fault. It's just also the result of, we talked about liquidity, where you manage a huge fund. And as you gather more assets, if you have like a $3 billion, $5 billion fund, you can, there are only so many names you can hold 10 up. Like Buffett manages five, like what, $500 billion? Yeah, yeah, yeah. His company Kevin, is, yeah, yeah. yeah. His company is five hundred billion, but I think his equity portfolio is maybe like eighty billion or something. Or Sounds about billion. right. Yeah, yeah, he probably has twenty, thirty names in there, and, yeah. and his heart they're all massive companies, and, exactly. and he doesn't outperform anymore, right? Yeah, because he's too big. So, um, yeah, no, I get your point. It's a size constraint. The size constraint is massive, and so that's why I don't, I don't, uh, I don't fault anyone at a large because I'm one of them, right? I don't fault anyone at a large financial institution managing money for other people. Once you're in the billions, it, the, the constraints are huge, especially in small market, as I mentioned. So I don't fault them. They're doing the best they can with the hand they're dealt. But what I do fault people for is the layers of bullshit. And, sorry, I don't know if I can swear on Oh, yeah, totally, yeah. <laughs> but there's just layers of crap, right? There's You don't need you know 50 to 100 inside wholesalers to go pester the whole country to, to pony up on the newest product or, or flip people out of things every year because they get trailer fees on, on, or they get a, they get a front end loaded fee on, on a new thing. And then they lock you up for it. For all that games, all that F class, C class, D class funds, like advisor series, you know, founders, partners, fund, all this marketing that's gotta go. Cause it's crap. Tell me what companies you're picking. What's your track record? I'll pay you, but not, not this, you know, uh, we do, uh, target date retirement funds and ultra balanced dynamic asset allocation tactical shift funds it's just crap like don't do any of that and, and the whole industry it's fell in love with that stuff i'm gonna guess around the financial crisis because it became like this structured product kind of mindset where the more complicated it is the easier it is to sell the more people like it yeah. and that has held true for a uh, the decades, right? That's nothing new. Because people don't want to buy simple because they'll say, why, why am I paying for simple? Here, exactly. Here, exactly. Take, this, take my money. Here, skim off the top. Take the 2% and give me something that's really co- complicated that doesn't do anything that you probably don't even understand yourself. Yeah, it's like, hey, man, you know, you, you're you some genius. I get it. You spend all your time looking at all these companies. That's great. And you've picked five awesome ones. Cool. I'll take those, run away, and I don't need you. So that is an inherent flaw in our industry, right? Is in any other industry, if you add value, that the market is very efficient, you get paid for your value, the like commensurate with your value. And people and customers in the market, capital is very efficient at saying, what's your value add qualitatively? And then here's the dollar amount. And they tend to meet up and line up. But in our industry, the value add was really low for decades and the price paid was super high. And then that is coming down, but even for people that add a lot of value, that they might get paid too little, right? Because there's there's firms out there, I won't name them, but there's really good firms in in multiple countries that are smaller and they're dynamic and they add a lot of value and they compound at really high rates and can outperform the index earned by the peer group by two, three, sometimes four, five hundred basis points a year, which after only a few years makes you quite well off right and after 10 15 years makes you filthy rich if you can come out of 500 basis points better than the market over 15 years you're you're laughing that's really good so and some of the best and the best make a track record in a career out of only maybe 100 basis points out of performance so and it's just people out there doing that but yeah they're not on the front page every day they're not billionaires driving lamborghinis they're not the hedge fund tycoons they're just kind of quiet and they might actually do well with it personally liquid but they, no one's going to write them a five million dollar check every year they just kind of make these average incomes but their liquid net worth is really good because they can compound capital so yeah there's this big disconnect between people that do add a lot of value fly below the radar really don't get paid that much stay small make themselves wealthy but don't get paid a big salary and these people get still get paid well above average, huge size, work for large organizations, asset gatherers, blah, 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 and deliver no value, or or most of the time negative value. So our industry is weird where capitalism hasn't married the two. It hasn't, what's your value add and here's your price paid? Almost, you know, if you're a doctor, like certain types of surgeons that are rare get paid more than others, like um, really complicated surgeries, if you're a specialist in that, you'll get paid better. Um, any industry, right? Yeah. Like engineers, if you're the only, you know, computer science engineer that can, you know, code a certain type of way, I don't know, like I'm, I'm making crap up <laughs> now, but 
the market is bears. If you're rare, you get paid well. And in investing, that's not the case. Yeah, it's a total, when we say asset gatherers, it's practically like, I think there is a common practice of even, I, I think it's actually a very common um, career tra- trajectory that a lot of people just look at and grasp towards is where you join a big fund, you stay there for years, and then you stay there for years. People assume that you're a really good investor despite just being at a big fund that <laughs> most of the time underperforms yeah. and just manages like a practically just an index, just moves index shit around all, all the time. I'm and so then, glad you brought that up because that's my biggest gripe in yeah. the industry is, is your resume <laughs> If theoretically, for an investor, your resume should be one thing, which is your track record. It should be what what stocks did you pick? What did each stock do? The Why market, did you pick yeah. it? And, and maybe build in like what's your Sortino ratio, right? Like what's your downside deviation? What's your upside capture? Maybe build that in. I could see some merit in that, but it should almost primarily be what the market gave me, ten percent. What you give me, twelve percent. How long did you do it over? Ten years. Like that is all it really should be. But the number one criteria that determines how people get paid in my industry, and there's no no one that will admit it, and there's no data behind it, but it's 100% true, is career longevity. If you are a, if you're a 20-year portfolio manager, you get paid more than a 10-year portfolio manager. If you're a five-year analyst, you get paid more than a first-year analyst. And that's the same in a lot of industries, right? In a lot of industries, time in is time paid. You know, the older you are, the more you get paid than the junior guys. But the offset, the, like the range is just huge in, in investing. Like the, you can be terrible at your job. You can be awful. But if you can say you have a 30 year track record, even if the track record is abysmal, you can find a home in our industry. You're very rare. People want that stability, longevity, gray hair, whatever. Oh, dude, you, 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 hate you, it. you sell that so well. You can, you can just say to 30 two, years, yes, look, people 30 just, years in asset management. It's this calming thing. Oh, yeah. he's been he must be experienced. 30 years. No one asks, <laughs> why are you still looking for a job 30 <laughs> years later, right? It's probably because you were terrible. So yeah. as opposed to the person who's been doing it five years, shooting the lights out, absolutely destroying it. Oh, you know, they're relatively great five years and gotta be careful with this person it's like it makes no sense and i also think like you mentioned about how all these great great uh, fund managers mm-hmm. tend to live somewhat of like a stoic mm-hmm. hidden life and i find that you know not faulting you mm-hmm. or anyone else who's passionate about investing who's mm-hmm. at a big fund but i find that you would get frustrated and you would end up trying to spend more time managing the money quote unquote the right way that you believe yep. and I'd say, I actually think from my experience, not many get a chance to actually own their own personal account. I think many funds Mm -hmm. block that. Yep. Um, So it's actually more on the rare side that you get to manage your personal account, I think. Well, I've been at at different ones. I've been at ones that allow a lot of flexibility and I've been at ones that allow zero flexibility. Yeah. So, and it's a huge, uh, uh, what's interesting on that, and I agree with you, is that the psychology of it is the most important thing. Again, like picking the stocks, you can add value that way, but the psychology of holding them and selling them is like all the alpha comes from that, in my opinion. That's the edge, and right? That's, that's the, the edge. edge. And so you're right. If you go from this high tempo, wake up at five in the morning, want to go day trade every day, and, and you let's know, trim something here, let's trim read, a, bank. read, a, read about you know soy futures in Japan and and, and short the yen and and long uh, British pound. Uh, equities i don't like equities and british pounds short the yen and think that that is the way to make money if you go from that which is just pure it's like mainlining adrenaline right if you go from that to you know the sleepy wake up whenever you want and read, and read a few read annual a, reports read a and... book maybe like i don't know go play golf like but what's interesting is the people that and when you look at retirees accounts and i've, I've worked for a boutique where I mean, so we're talking about asset management, but there's also the wealth management side that I've worked in, which is people come in and see you, they have a portfolio, they have tax liabilities, they have real financial stuff and you have to deal with it. The people that do the best are the people that take the I don't care mindset. Those people always have the best returns. Like someone who comes in and forgot that they own. I remember I, I worked somewhere where a lot of people, you heard of the company en- Enbridge? Yeah. Went on a phenomenal run for 20, 30 years, uh, generating tons of wealth, paying increasing dividends. So it could make you quite wealthy if all you owned was Enbridge. And I remember at a certain firm, I think I met with uh, five people 
and five accounts that all had put in a rule when they started with this particular money manager. They said, don't sell my Enbridge. I can't remember why it was. They might have worked there, whatever it is, but don't sell my Enbridge. So everything else, the portfolio manager could trade, Enbridge, they're not allowed to touch. You invest it and you can't sell it. And the returns on that thing were crazy, right? And everything else had fluctuated, whatever. And so it grew into this massive part of the portfolio. There's nothing you could do about it. But that just shows you, right? Like, just don't sell it. And and these people did really well. And, and you know, they were basically retired living off their, their Enbridge. Not, not the rest of the portfolio. And these were, again, 20, 25 stock portfolios where one delivered all the alpha, all, all the uh, upside. And that was because the portfolio manager was not allowed to sell it. They were... They were legislated against their own psychology. And so I, I think you're right. If I if I ever left the big fund kind of game, um, which I don't rule really out, I might do at some point, um, a big thing for me will be trying to decode. And I'd also love to write a book about it or read a book about it because no one talks about it. How to, how to uh, constructively distract yourself. Because we're, we're in an environment right now where people get distracted like crazy. And, and, and that's not what I mean. I mean... How to be in control in the driver's seat driving the car, but not be like gazing at the window, like going crazy frenetically looking at um, what's on the road. Like, look, you know what I mean? Like a good driver doesn't freak out about all stimulus outside the car or in the car. They just drive the car. So they're in control. It's kind of like a meditative thing. You're in control, but you're very like fluid and, and just chilling not overreacting to anything in fact underreacting to everything and so a big thing for me would be to try to figure and i haven't done it would be try to figure out do you like do you just get a hobby do you like do you golf all the time do you pick up arts and crafts do you um spend a lot of time with your family like what what is a constructive way to know what's going on with your businesses because you want to know everything right you want to know when the tide's going to turn, when something goes wrong, when the management team is soured, when someone's left. That's still very important to knowing when to sell. So how do you manage that bucket of things to know, then at the same time be able to go 10 years without doing anything? And marrying the two is something I think hasn't been scientifically deconstructed or, or talked about or written about, and it's something I'm really fascinated by. But it's the psychology of inactivity. How do you do nothing but still hold the reins and mm-hmm. earn a lot of money so. yeah no I, I I think that's where a lot of the value comes in for the money manager it's just it's and that's where the value for private equity guys come in and venture capital guys it's, it's the forced hand shackling of yeah, the liquidity yeah, just, seven years is the whatever like private yeah, equity holds for seven years yeah. someone invented that years ago I don't know but yeah that's where they make their money like I mean, to be blunt, leverage helps a lot. Oh, totally. <laughs> they like buy things cheap, with, cheap debt. If I can use nine, nine turns of debt uh, with no, like, costing me nothing, I can probably make you an okay amount of money. But besides the debt, I think you're right. It's their force. They marry things for at least three years, three to seven years, sometimes 10 plus years. Yeah. I, I think I think something else I noticed is also just the fund industry, like just for investors in Canada, is very, it's different from the U.S. as well. I find Americans... Well, compensation wise, I think there's also a huge difference. I think uh, p- folks in like the buy side in the U.S. actually end up getting compensated at an even much higher clip. Oh yeah, um, yeah, I think so. From um, some other folks I've been talking, mm-hmm. about. but something else I also noticed as a difference was I spoke to um, a fellow who's at a fund down in the U.S. and mm-hmm. I was telling him about, oh yeah, everyone. I would say most people I've met are actually somewhat still passionate about investing, like whether they're at a big fund or a small fund whether you're actually outperforming or not, they still somewhat love it. Some love it more than others. Mm-hmm. And the guy who was in New York was very surprised because I think everyone here hates it. We all we all hate what we're doing, but we do it to make the money we need to make. Yeah. And I was very surprised given how we have so few seats here I know. in Canada for people I will, who are actually, I actually passionate. It's interesting. Like I, I think I, if I look back at myself, I started with like, you know, 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10 passion, which I think is, it's table stakes. That's what you need to get into our industry. Like if you're 90% passionate and 10% skeptical, you will never break into our industry. It's only the crazy, unless you went to a great school, whatever pedigree, some of those people sneak in, but generally speaking, it's people that wake up and think of nothing else but, but equities that make it into public equities. Yeah, like usually when kids like email me or we have a phone call out, first ask them, okay, have you, 
tell me all the books you've read. Like, yeah. If we don't get past like book twenty or thirty, then it's then it goes to like okay, well, I I don't know what you're talking about. Like the guy I spoke to didn't even know who Phil Fisher was. Oh, it's and, my favorite. Yeah, and I was the thing like, oh my god, how do you, what? Or the big test too for me is tell me what stocks you like, or tell me what stocks you've bought, or what's your portfolio like. And even if it's someone really young, they'll usually have a, a, a virtual account or they'll whatever. Like, show me some signs of that. If you're in this industry, I've met people in this industry, I kid you not, with over 10 years experience that don't have a personal account and have never bought a stock personally. They will never bought it for other people. That scares the crap out of me. How can you know how to do something for someone else if you've never done it for yourself? And that's the thing. I feel like a, a lot of people still in the asset management industry are the people who just wanted to get that lifestyle. They wanted the title. Yeah. They wanted the quote-unquote prestige and I think, I think there's that I've, yeah. I've been i've been very fortunate to work with more of the truly passionate yeah which has kept me in the business but you're right there are people that do it for and i've worked with them recently there's people that that really want to there's there's different types everyone's different right but there's there's the competitive person there's the person that wants to go crush everyone kill everyone be the best be the number one and investing is an industry game where you get ranked every day, every minute of every uh, market hour, and you're told where you rank in your peer group, right? So if your peer group's 300 funds, every month your back office will send you, you know, an attribution report saying you're 10th percentile, you're in the top 10%, so you're, you're fund number 30 or something. That, for, you know, for people with that competitive drive killer instinct, that's what keeps them in. And that's never really been it for me. It's been this, I think it's... Um, it's a guy named Tom Russo. He talks about hunters versus farmers. And it's a great little speech he gives. And, and he just uses this little parallel of, you know, the really successful investors that he likes are these long-term thinkers that are farmers. They plant little seeds and they watch them grow. And then the majority of the industry is hunters, people that they're trying to kill and whatever, like, like you know, stab, you know, animals. and, and, and make, make the trim cut here and then yeah. add a little basis point. Yeah, here. exactly. And that's the hunter mentality, right? And so I've worked with, Quite a few hunters. I've worked with some farmers, but the farmer breed is very rare. And when you find people like that, they tend to be passionate. But again, that psychology of the inactivity of being in control but doing nothing. And uh, those people are really, really rare. I can admit I'm not one of them. I'm more naturally a hunter, but I, I'm a hunter trying to learn how to be a farmer. Uh, and to fully learn it, I'll have to at some point do the, do set up my own shop, do my own thing. And, and I don't have the confidence yet to do that, but. Um, eventually I'll, I'd love to do that and um, yeah I think that's I think that analogy of the farmer versus the hunter is very, very apt for our industry and yeah and what, what would you say like, just kind of big myths that people have about what you do and big myths yeah like yeah I don't know, there's like a we, bunch yeah, yeah. Well, what, what are some big ones well I think what what people a negative one people have is that we don't actually know companies. The people that know investing or know what private equity is, they think they look down on asset management as you don't know companies. You don't really know. You didn't earn your stripes in investment banking, maybe. You don't know how to build it on Excel. And all That's wrong. <laughs> we know it just as well as you do. We just don't know all the Excel shortcuts and all the fancy crap that you get working at two in the morning. I can model the crap out of companies just as well as anyone else in, in, in buy side or sell side. The different and and what's more interesting is and this is a myth that they get wrong again they think we don't know companies it's the opposite there's no other industry where a 20 year old or a 25 year old or a 30 year old can call up the ceo of a 10 or 50 billion dollar company and they have to pick up the phone how cool is that right like ask an investment banker whether they can go call up the ceo of, of a s&p 550 billion dollar company and have either their ir or their cfo or the ceo pick up and asset management is the only industry I know where you can do that. You can be as junior as you want. And if you're at a firm with big assets, you have, you know, you have tons of influence. And in the 80s and 90s, that influence got people into trouble. Like, you know, that's where insider trading gets into or whatever. But even with all that negativity, the positivity of it is awesome. Like how well, it's awesome to be able to learn a company and have those resources and have a $30,000 Bloomberg at your disposal and, have hundreds of sell side uh, brokers offering you their research and trying to get you to come see companies and take meetings and read a report and all oh, we we commissioned a hundred thousand dollar study of Chinese luxury buyers and you know we want you to read this for free and you're sitting there thinking like this is all just because I work at X firm 
and that's my influence. And so I think a myth is that asset management is like less prestigious. You know companies less well. You know your stuff less well. I'd say in some cases that's true. But when you're playing in the big leagues in asset management, it's just as, in my opinion, just as prestigious as, as banking or private equity. So I, when I see a lot of kids that are really want to like go up the prestige curve and they're only focused on banking and private equity, I just kind of sit there and laugh. I'm like, you know, enjoy working till two in the morning seven days a week and really being effectively Excel jockey or a PowerPoint monkey, right? And then on the flip side, you can start day one in asset management and call up a company and demand a meeting. You know, demand's hard work, but you can get a meeting, you can go to lunch, you can get people to take you out for lunch. Like, it's a lot of perks. So I'd say that's a myth. Another myth um, is, uh, is that it's easy. You know, you pick a stock, it goes up. And the hardest thing about that is retail fads. That people think, wow, you're so dumb. Like, what? how have you done this year? Oh, you know, I'm up 8%. The market's up 7 Yeah, I doubled my money in, in cannabis stocks or whatever. I'm in, I'm in whatever. Whatever the fad of the day is will always make people, by definition, a fad will make people more money until it loses them everything, right? And that's bubble, right? So, or crypto or any of that stuff. So, things that most investors I would respect to myself included we would avoid become these retail fads. And retail goes out and they... They crush the institutional investor for maybe a year or two, and then they lose everything, and then they end up net flat or net worse, or they lose their insurance, whatever. So I think the myth, a couple myths are, yeah, it's not prestigious. I'd rather go be an investment banker. <laughs> on a work-life balance, on any perks or whatever, I'd say that's a myth. That's wrong. And then the other would be, uh, yeah, that it's, you know, anyone can do this at home, any pajama trader or whatever. It's really easy. And I tend to think that that's a myth. Yeah, um, no, totally. I think those are two definitely like big ones that you would bust um, in the asset management industry. And as we were kind of like wrapping up to like the closing ends of the um, the interview, is there any question that you, you feel like I didn't answer or, or you wish like I had a- or I had asked um, mm-hmm. regarding like helping people understand more about what you do or just the industry in general? Yeah, I, I, one thing I'd say is like there was. I rant a lot and there's a lot of negativity probably in this conversation, but at the end of the day, it is, there's a couple things that are really positive about this industry. It's one of the only ones where you have this objective fact checker, you know, decider of right and wrong, determining how good you are every day. It's the market. And a lot of other industries, if you want to go be a doctoral student or or go go be a, a researcher or scientist, you have to wait years for your study to come out and then years after that to see if you were actually right and to check your findings. And then even then people might disagree with you. And so there's really not this objective barometer of how good you are and investing is great. If you're someone that craves objective, you know, evidence of your skill, of your hard work, investing is awesome. And it's unique that way. So that's a positive. And then another positive is, you know, even though people, get into situations where they make mistakes or they don't do best by their clients. Often, most people are pretty good natured. I haven't met too many people that are truly you know, doing the wrong thing. And so that's another thing I just want to caveat that despite all the negativity you talked about, people are generally good natured. They just they just get into situations where you can't do right. Um, and I think eventually things will sort itself out in our industry, but it's going to take some time. But yeah, no, it's not all negative. There are some positives. <laughs> no, totally. And I like when I tell people about the industry, I tell them how if you really want to learn about business, it's I honestly don't think there's any better job you can have. Like like you said, um, I've spoken to way more CEOs ever in my advice role than I ever did in consulting. Mm-hmm. But yet again, consulting or banking will say, yeah. Do you want to talk to C suite? You get to advise people. You don't. No. The, the, like my friend in banking spent I think after his first full year, he finally told me that, yeah, I finally got to sit in on a phone call with mm. the CEO of this company. Didn't get to say a word, but I got invited. I'm so special. Yeah. So if like, you crave that stuff, damn, there's, uh, it's called asset management. <laughs> Try to break on it. And the only other thing I would say is, you know, that um, uh, you sort of talked about, like, is there any other, it's probably the best way to learn about business. I would agree with that in the right environment. And then the only other thing I think is a dying art is is entrepreneurship, but not VC startups, if that makes sense. So like go start, 
yeah, just go bootstrap, start a restaurant. It's an awful business, but go try it. And you'll learn, like, starting a restaurant and failing is going to teach you way more than a business degree, an MBA, and five years in, in the asset management industry combined. Oh, dude, my business degree is not proving to be any useful <laughs> right now. <laughs> yeah. Like, all this stuff I'm learning about monetizing and marketing, like, that's yeah. a whole separate conversation. You know what? But, oh, man. Like, day one, if I told you, you have to go, I'll give you 50 grand, go start a business, and it has to be up and running in 12 months. The next 12 months of your life are going to teach you way more about the world, way more about yourself, and way more about business than any investing book or anything like that. So I think that the overlaps between entrepreneurship and investing are interesting and, on, you know, relatively underexplored too. Yeah, totally. Um, yeah. All right, man. Thanks a lot for coming on yeah, the podcast. Yeah, no, this was good. This yeah, was there's a lot of fun, and I think the listeners will get a lot of value out of it too. Cool. Yeah, thanks. So thanks for listening to the podcast. If you enjoyed what you heard, please check out other episodes and don't forget to subscribe to stay up to date for the future episodes. Also, I would really appreciate it if you would leave a review on iTunes, Google Play, or Stitcher, whichever is applicable to you. To see past episodes, you can go to oldmandan.com slash podcast. Also, you can sign up to my weekly newsletter on my blog, oldmandan.com slash newsletter. You can stay up to date with future podcast episodes that way. And included in the newsletter are my book reviews I write, my weekly article in the related to the domain of self-development systems, as well as seven things I learned throughout the week on being healthy, wealthy, and wise. Finally, special thanks to icons8.com for allowing me to use their music, Tiny People, on the podcast. Great. I will see you all next time. Take care.